Hello, my name is Tony. There's a part of me that didn't want to do this. Then there's another part of me that felt I should do this. Then there's a part of me, well, actually, no, there isn't. There are no more parts of me. That's it. Why should I not want to do this? Well, for a start, the subject is a John Wayne film, and one cannot reminisce over a John Wayne film without the subject of John Wayne cropping up. At least for me, that's not going to be possible. He was one of the most popular and successful actors ever to come out of Hollywood. A paradoxical and a divisive individual if there ever was one. Separating his body of work from the man himself is something of a tricky business. Because on the one hand, you've got this literal definition of a fundamental movie action hero who was tough, loyal, often tender, yet aggressive and violent when he had to be. Conflicted when it meant something, stood for most of the good things about America. Freedom, morality, equality, all that stuff. A mythic, truly iconic and monumental legendary figure, resolute, steadfast, dependable and righteous. Here was a man who embodied human elements of sacrifice, patriotism, bravery, heroism, truth and justice in a way that resonated with audiences around the globe. God bless America. God bless John Wayne. In some ways, he was the American dream. And in some ways, he was America. At least, that was his crafted persona. Film historian Andrew Saris observed in 1979 that his most enduring image was that of a displaced loner, uncomfortable with the very civilization he helped to establish and preserve. He was probably thinking about his roles in films like The Searchers, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, The Alamo, and even True Grit. But it seems true that from Stagecoach in 1939 on, in most of his pictures, Wayne was partially defined or defined himself as something of an outsider, a no Noble, heroic, crusading outsider, but an outsider nonetheless. So that's the one hand. On the other hand, in the real world, this is a guy who, when many of his contemporaries were signing up for active service in World War II, chose to stay at home and make war movies in their absence, and thus in the absence of competition. He never saw active service, he only served on screen. He was a supporter of the McCarthy witch hunts in the 50s, wherein many talented creative individuals were hounded, persecuted and blacklisted for their real or imagined political beliefs. Some were people he had worked alongside. He hated High Noon because he thought it un-American. He supported the war in Vietnam and Tricky Dicky Nixon's Republican paranoia show. He was at heart selfish and self-serving. His priority was to look after number one. He was a heavy drinker, chain smoker, preoccupied with his own personal perceptions of male machismo, with little tolerance for anyone who wasn't a white heterosexual male or female. In a 1971 Playboy interview, he controversially expressed a belief in white supremacy until, as he put it, black people became educated enough to run their own affairs. He strongly indicated homophobic views and argued for draconian reform of the US welfare system, whilst throwing in that the white settlers had every right to take the land of the American Indians as a simple matter of survival of the fittest. Joseph Stalin once made a statement that Wayne should be assassinated for his anti-communist stance and agenda. And yet, even Stalin confessed to being a big fan of his movies, held personal screenings in the Kremlin. Whilst I can't claim to ever had much in common with Uncle Joe, I can sort of feel where he's coming from. It's complex. There's something of an emotional and intellectual duality of perception, a definite conflict at play here. So here's how I square things. As a person, a human being, I would disagree with him and his beliefs on many subjects, and if I had ever met him, I probably wouldn't have liked him very much, if at all. But should his distasteful political opinions, his glaring bigotry, willful ignorance and intolerance mean that I can't enjoy him as an actor or appreciate his movies? Some would say yes, it does. But that in itself is a form of inverted intolerance, and smacks of the type of hypocritical nouveau fascism peddled by cancel culture. If all art were rendered only permissible for consumption by virtue of the absence of certain designated human flaws in the artist, then we would consume no art. Sure, everyone draws the line somewhere, but that should be a matter of personal choice and conscience, and not for others to forcibly impose. So it's my choice to set the man aside and stick with the work. Shakespeare in Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 2, reminds, The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. Wayne made some good films. It's up to me if I want to keep watching them, while I'm still allowed to do so, that is. 
Why should I do this? Well, let me tell you. When I was in my formative childhood years, tail end of the 60s leading into the 70s, I absolutely adored and idolised John Wayne. He was my favourite actor. So influential a star that the BBC would screen seasons of his movies under the banner Wayne in Action on Friday nights. Now, I may be wrong, but for any other actor in the world at the time, this was unheard of. A season dedicated solely to them and their films only. I can't think of any other instance where this had ever occurred on any of the UK terrestrial channels of the day, and as there were only three of them at the time, I feel safe in making this observation. I would watch with awe and excitement films such as Stagecoach, Reap the Wild Wind, The Fighting Sea Bees, Sands of Iwo Jima, Flying Leathernecks, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, The Common Cheeros, and marvel at the sheer star presence of the Duke strutting his stuff on the TV screen. What a guy! There's no denying John Wayne left a lasting impression on me. As he got older and times moved on, the Spaghettis and Peckinpah reimagining and refocusing the traditional Western format forever, Wayne couldn't be accused of moving easily with those times. I suppose The Cowboys in 1972 was a reasonable attempt at grounding his mythology, first time he is seen getting killed directly on screen by another distinct person, Bruce Dern no less. And Big Jake in 1971 made some stylistic nods to more gratuitous forms of violence with flickers of sadism thrown in. It remains a personal favourite of mine. There is a certain acknowledgement in his later films of the realities of ageing. This theme reached a conclusion in his final picture, Don Siegel's The Shootist in 1976, where he unselfconsciously portrayed an elderly gunfighter dying of terminal cancer. The illness, lung cancer, first diagnosed in 1964, morphed into stomach cancer and caught up with and took him in 1979. The Shootist is one of his best films, and it's fitting that his on-screen career ended on a high note, rather than the two comparatively bum notes that preceded it, Brannigan in 1974 and Rooster Cogburn in 1975. Brannigan begs the question, what with 170 plus films to choose from, why he decide to focus on his last but one screen outing? There are the usual suspects up for grabs like She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, Red River, The Searchers, Rio Bravo, Liberty Valance, El Dorado, True Grit, all solid candidates that represent some of the best work Wayne had to offer. Thing is, they're all westerns, and it's a bit obvious to settle on either a war flick or a western, the genres for which Wayne was most famous, and a appraisals of which have been done to death. He didn't make many contemporary crime thrillers set in the comparatively modern world. There was McHugh in 1974, a stab at playing a Harry Callahan type of character, taken on because Wayne felt he had lost out over not playing the lead in Dirty Harry. I'm not so keen on McHugh. It's too derivative, unevenly paced, badly structured and sloppily directed by the then chronically alcoholic John Sturges. Bodie of CI5 suggested Brannigan as an option sometime back, and one of my favourite guns, the Mauser M712 Schnellfeuer, is used by the Hitman. I have a possibly morbid fascination with this gun, as mentioned in my previous video about Ollie Reed's wonderful sit-in target. So all things considered, Brannigan it is, although it was a close-run thing between this and Big Jake. I do like Big Jake, it may rear its head sometime in the future, but for now... Big John Wayne is Big Jim Brannigan, a Chicago detective who, in the real world, would be a decade or so past retirement. We first see him kicking in a door on a counterfeiting operation and announcing his arrival with Knock Knock. Knock Knock. The writers like this entrance so much they repeat it later on. Knock Knock. The counterfeiter informs Brannigan there's a contract out on him. Brannigan is unperturbed because he's a tough guy who shrugs off little things like death threats. Brannigan is sent to London to extradite a crime boss, Larkin, who is played by, yep, John Vernon, yet again. God, this guy was relentless. It's Larkin who has put the hit on Brannigan. The hitman is Gorman, Daniel Pylan, who later appeared in Dallas. Wow. He's a low-level sexual sadist and all-round nasty piece of work. Ideal for Dallas, then. On arrival, Brannigan is met by Jenny, a liaison officer played by Judy Geeson, who frequently played pretty, petite, cute and sweet English chicks because that's more or less what she was. Immediately, hopes and prayers are offered that she isn't going to be Brannigan's romantic interest. Don't worry, she isn't. Thank any god in striking distance for that. Although Big Jim does infer that if he were several years, well, decades younger, he'd be on her like a tramp on a kipper. Richard Attenborough appears as Commander Sir Charles Swan of New Scotland Yard. He reassures Brannigan 
Flanagan that they're keeping a close eye on Larkin and his slippery lawyer Mel Field, played by Mel Ferrer. Not close enough though because Larkin is kidnapped from a steam bath and gets a finger amputated and posted to the fuzz. The rest of the film has Brannigan tooling destructively around London landmarks, avoiding assassination attempts by Gorman and trying to identify the kidnappers and locate Larkin for extradition. Brannigan, the movie, doesn't commit to being one thing or the other. It doesn't aim for the X-rated Dirty Harry end of the genre, nor does it angle fully towards the usurped family-friendly audience. There is some violence, some blood, people get shot at close range, there is a smattering of profanity, no explicit sex or nudity, some explosions, a competent car chase with the added novelty of Wayne jumping a Ford Capri over Tower Bridge and into a skip. To all intents and purposes, it's a western in modern clothing. The tough stranger strides into town on a mission to apprehend the bad guys. There's even a brawl in a bar, into which Wayne pointedly enters through Batswing saloon doors. It's a fish-out-of-water flick, and the culture clash between Wayne's more direct form of policing and Attenborough's prim and proper restraint is played for mild humour, Brannigan carrying a Colt diamond back revolver being a notable bone of contention. He may be aging here, but on screen, Wayne still has that commanding larger-than-life star presence. In stature, he seems to dwarf the rest of the cast. He's always watchable, even if he ambles rather than runs through the action sequences. Not sure why Attenborough signed up. Maybe after having worked with such definitive Hollywood greats as Steve McQueen and Jimmy Stewart, he felt the need to stand alongside Wayne when the opportunity arose. Brannigan is an undemanding time burner, rainy Sunday afternoon fare. The sort of thing you'd find on the truly great and thoroughly invaluable talking picture channel. Historically, the location work in 70s London provides something of a window onto that time and place. Overall, it's not particularly thrilling or dynamic, the dialogue is riddled with cliches and a bit cringe-inducing, and the script certainly provides no showcase opportunity for any great dramatic acting performances. But then it's not that type of thing. I'm almost inclined to label it something of a curio, as it doesn't fit conclusively into any particular niche. It was a box office flop, both in the U UK and the US, and it's easy to see why. Ultimately, it's too light-hearted and lightweight to be considered a serious crime thriller, and a touch too old-fashioned in both content and execution, even for 1975. The hook of seeing John Wayne in an unfamiliar environment was seemingly not enough to generate mass audience interest, and it's the main thing it has going for it. The screenplay, A Pedestrian Affair, was by Michael Butler and Christopher Trumbo. Christopher was the son of Dalton Trumbo, a famous Hollywood screenwriter are blacklisted in the 50s by the House of Un-American Activities Committee, of which Wayne was a member and supporter. Strange then how Trumbo Jr. ended up writing this John Wayne vehicle. Maybe he deliberately made it nothing special as payback. If a guy had put my old man out of work, I wouldn't be busting a gut for him. But then, on the other hand, we've all got to eat. Director Douglas Hickox gave us the deliciously grim and fatalistic 1972 Ollie Reed vehicle Sitting Target, which is one of my all-time weapons of choice, but here his work is much more mundane and restrained, lacking the stylistic flourishes that made that film such a nihilistic blast. You wouldn't imagine Brannigan was directed by the same person. These days, it's a stretch to conceive of who would want to see it. At the time of release, I was still pretty much an unashamed Wayne fan, so I made the effort. And any film that features the Mauser M712 Schnell viewer can't be all bad. I certainly prefer it to McHugh. You could have some fun sightseeing in the London of the time and marvelling at how much it has changed, or spotting all the fleeting character actors who pop up like a game of jobbing thespian whack-a-mole. James and Anthony Booth, John Stride, Leslie Ann Down, Brian Glover, Don Henderson, Del Henny, and a pre-Blackadder Tony Robinson as a motorcycle courier Wayne throws in the Thames. In fairness to the big guy, he does ask if he can swim beforehand. Doubt Eastwood would have. Brannigan is not a great film, probably not that good at all comparatively speaking. Wayne fans and completists will have already seen it, and those who don't like either the man or his movies won't be watching this video anyway. If you've nothing better to do, it will idle away some time and will leave you generally but not distressingly underwhelmed. Watch The Searchers if you want quality classic western cinema, or Big Jake for sentimentality laced with violence, or The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance for a meditation on mythology, or The Shootist if you want to see a man bow out and give it his finest part in shot with whatever he has left. That way you'll be experiencing John Wayne, actor and star, at his best by my reckoning. As for Brannigan, save it for that rainy Sunday afternoon. 
Once again, thanks so much for your time and attention. Like, don't, subscribe, comment, however the mood takes you. Meanwhile, here's a song called How the West Was Done. Adios, pilgrims. telecommunications and they had the right kit sold it to all the nations and soon the pieces fit some curious aberrations the mainframes had to share all your secret information We jack up every bit Someone ever ask you how the race was never run Mister, let me tell you now That's how the West was done Thank you.